It is Wednesday afternoon, March 6th. We're picking up in Bereshit, uh, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 22. We've just come through a very sad time for Yaakov. Jacob has just lost his beloved Rachel. He's had to bury her on the way to uh, Hebron, to the Beersheba area, to where I I Isaac Yitzhak, his father, is. Uh, but he has had to bury her on the way. It was near Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, which was about, I'm going to say six miles south of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem. Uh, at that time, it, they were about two miles outside of Bethlehem, but it today is part of Bethlehem, and Bethlehem is much closer to Jerusalem just because of the building up of the, the area. You know, just like here, we used to have cities and communities that were further apart from each other, and now the, the border, you don't know when you crossed one and into the other. So anyway, they're headed toward um, the Beersheba area. He is coming back. Uh, remember, he wanted to return to Beit El, the house of God, where he made the altar to God, where he had the vision of the ladder, and we saw that God met him again at Beit El. And after this now, um, and after losing Rachel in childbirth, um, and we looked last time long and hard, and again, I want to bring it out. There are those who try to say, because Jacob made that comment that anybody you know who, who was guilty of bringing the idols from Levon's house that they should be put to death and that this was why Rachel died in childbirth we've got 20 25 years in between not only that but we're going to see also that when Benjamin is uh, the one that the gold cup is found with him and the elder brothers you know had said the same thing whoever or was you know pronounced the same if whoever's found with it should never be free again, da, da, da. You know, if God took all of our words of everything we said, how many people are guilty of saying that they hate someone and that's equal to saying they want them murdered, we'd have people dropping like flies. <laughs> We're not in control of the days like that. Our words are not powerful in that way. Are words powerful? Oh, absolutely. Words do hurt. Words do build up. Words do sink ships. Words do, you know, rise something up. So we still should not have blessing and cursing coming out of the same mouth. We should be careful what we're saying. I'm not giving a right to anything not, but we should not be rash and quick in what we say either. And we looked at that at length last time we talked about Jephthah, who uh, his daughter was, quote, supposed to be sacrificed because he said, the first that comes out of my house, I'll give to the Lord and sacrifice. He gave her to the Lord. She dedicated her entire life to the Lord. She didn't have children. She, she didn't marry and have children and carry their family uh, name down because he didn't have sons. But um, they lost that privilege. But he did not sacrifice her. God never asked for human sacrifice. He gave human sacrifice for us. He gave his son. He did not ask for us to give ours. Uh, so big difference there. And uh, Rachel did not die because Jacob said something, you know, that, that he was unaware that Rachel was involved in. But it was the days that God had ordained for her on this earth. And so she went home at the time God had ordained it. He's going to move forward, but you're going to see he's... He's got a heart that really he hurts for the rest of his life over the losses that he endures. But he's gone now past that watchtower that was a landmark that was watching for robbers in the area and so forth. And he's moving on down toward his father, returning to the house of his father. Before that, though, we read in verse 22, and it came about. Well, Israel, that's his new name that God has renamed him, and it's showing his spiritual character, the, the rename of Jacob, if you didn't follow me, that while he was living in that land, in that area where, in the Be heading toward the Beersheba area, that Reuben, that's his firstborn son, Reuben went and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard about it. Okay, it's probably mentioned here because this is what causes Reuben to lose his birthright. He, being the firstborn son, should have been the one to receive the birthright. That's the spiritual leader of the family. But this sin is so grievous. He's gone to his mother's um, maid and he's had relations with her and that was so anathema 
that we read in chapter 49 of Genesis, and I know it'll be a little bit before we get there, so we'll go ahead and, and um, take our sneak peek. In chapter 49, verses 3 and 4, where um, Jacob is prophesying over his 12 sons, this is what he says about Reuben. Chapter 49 and verse 3. Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrollable as water. You shall not have preeminence. So he's got all this power and all this strength. He's got great leadership skills, but can you control water? No. When the floods come, they wipe out a house if your house is in the way. You can't control. You, you can try to navigate. You can try to, to channel, but we know that it, water does what water wants to do. So in that um, instability, I'll put it that way, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Bilhah was not only Rachel's maid, he, she was a <clears throat> concubine, which meant that she was like a wife without any of the wifely privileges. But we know that she was the mother of Dan and Naphtali, Don and Naphtali, two of um, Jacob's 12 sons, and we know how close she was to Rachel. So um, Reuben at this time is probably at least 24 years old. He might have been more like 28, somewhere in, in his 20s. But, uh, and by the way, we also read of this in 1 Chronicles 5, and I want to bring something out about that either, um, either now or, or I'll come across it again, but because it may be now, let me go ahead and have us read that too. 1 Chronicles um, 5. In verses 1 and 2. And here is where we read. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, and in parentheses, for he was firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. So he's still one of the 12 sons of Jacob, but the birthright has been taken from him. That spiritual head, that spiritual leadership, and moving on down toward um, what will, well, what develops, we know it comes to the mess, it's part of the messianic line and so forth. Anyway, um, because of his age and because of what's written here in both these accounts, we're not reading anything of someone on trial. We're not reading of a, a big controversy. So it's highly unlikely that he raped her. It probably was more uh, consensual between them. It could be that um, she enticed him if, if she was feeling left out. I don't know. It could be that they were trying to comfort each other with the loss of Rachel. They got a little too close and things just got carried away and they didn't control what they should have controlled. But it would be the same thing as if he had gone into his own mother um, and had relationships with her. So God looks down on this so greatly, it's so gregarious to him that it is commanded against this. Jacob probably put a stop to it. They, you know, probably was not something that continued on. And uh, he realized that the son did not have the spiritual strength that needed to be there to carry on with that birthright. So um, he loses his birthright over it. I think I've probably said it well enough. And by the way, if you want proof that Bilha was the mother of Dan and Naphtali, it's mentioned in chapter 30 of Genesis, verses 5 through 8. And it's mentioned again in chapter 35, verse 25. So it, this was costly. It was a mistake. Mistakes have consequences. Sins have consequences. And this was a huge consequence. So he's still listed here. He's still the firstborn, but he will not go on and have um, the birthright. Uh, and his father somehow heard about, was made aware of what had happened. So now we go on with there were 12 sons of Yaakov. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon, or Shimon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. The sons of Rachel, Rachel, were Joseph and Benjamin, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, after naming his two wives, the two sisters, now he talks about their two handmaids and the children through them. The sons of Bilhah, oh, we've got it here too. This, uh, yeah, this is 3525. <laughs> 
<laughs> sorry, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's female slave, were Dan, Don, and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's female slave, were, and it says Gad in your English. God is the Hebrew pronunciation, but it, <clears throat> let's go with Gad so you don't get confused, and Asher. These were the sons of Yaakov who were born to him in Padan Aram. Okay, notice how you've got all of these names. What you don't have in here is Benjamin, Benjamin, because he was not born in Padan Aram. He was born when uh, Jacob had returned into the Holy Land. He was born en route, as we've said, between um, Shechem and Beersheba, when, when, where Jacob ultimately um, will go to. So, Jacob came to his father, Yitzhak, at memory of Kiryat Arba, that is Hebron, and Hebron the Beersheba areas where Isaac was known, um, Beersheba is where the wells were, the flocks would have been all over, and it was, as this clearly says, where Abraham and Yitzhak had resided. So, Yaakov, Jacob went out from his father's house. This is chapters back. He went out to get a wife. He went out with literally a staff in his hand, and that was it. He didn't go out with entourage, he didn't go out with family members, he didn't go out with slaves. It was Jacob, and it was Jacob alone. He returns now to his father's house with 12 sons. It shows that he was very blessed by the faithful covenant of God, and he returns now as his father's heir. Yitzhak is aging, Yaakov has a responsibility of the firstborn uh, birthright, even though he was not firstborn, it was given to him. He needs to be there. He needs to be taking responsibility. He needs uh, to be in that area. And I misspoke because Benjamin is listed here. Sorry, folks, and I don't know if any of you caught that. Even though he's listed here, it did not mean that he was born in Padan Aram, but this is his heritage. And it's important that Benjamin was listed in the heritage because he was one of the 12 sons. So even though he was not born out of the land, it's still, um, he's still listed here because as the writer is writing, they know of Benjamin. They know that, that of his birth. So he is included in here in this time. Um, it's important that we see the fullness of the blessing that came to Jacob and all that belonged to him. And we know that there's great significance in the 12 sons becoming the 12 tribes. So Benjamin needed to be in there. He needed to be listed, not left absent just because he wasn't born back in um, Mesopotamia. Okay, so he came to his father's house. Now, this is not telling us that Jacob's finally seeing Isaac for the first time. This is a number of years, probably close to 25 years since he's been in Padan Aram, at least 20, at least 20 that we can account for. So it's highly unlikely that Yaakov would have gotten that close and never gone to see his father. It's just that he, perhaps he wasn't ready to take over everything to be in that spiritual fellowship until all that he's gone through. And now that he is prepared, he is moving into that area to follow through with what he knows is his responsibilities. But he's been in um, the land at least 11, 12 years that, that he was around Shechem before he came on down, loses Rachel, and keeps on going and comes to his father's house. It's probably, we'll just say in round figures, 30 years since he went out. He's come back full, though. He's come back with 12 sons. He still has um, Leah and two concubines uh, and, you know, slaves and flocks and herds. He's come out. He's come back full. Um, but again, he's moving now and it's being recorded now because he's going to move into that position of his father's heir. He's going to be taking over. We're going to read very shortly when we get into the next chapter, the line of Aesop, and we'll see where that line ends, but you're going to see how it doesn't have the predominant role in regard to the forefathers of Israel and the heritage of Israel. So verse 20 tells us that the days of Yitzhak were 180 years. Okay, Jacob then would be back in the land, I'm going to say 20 to 25 years, Jacob's 120 if Isaac is 180, okay? Isaac was 60 
when Jacob was born. That was back in chapter 25, verse 26. But remember, time goes on us, and we tend to think um, of people much younger and closer in age because that's our lifestyle. But we just need to remember this. So if Isaac dies at 180, how old does that make Jacob? 60. Minus 60, uh, 160. so 120, 120, oh. because he was 60 years old um, when, he, when he gave birth to um, Jacob. So if Isaac's 180, Jacob's 120. That makes Joseph about 30 years old. We haven't even gotten into Joseph yet, and he's already 30 years old. We're going to back up and see more. But Joseph was born to Jacob when he was somewhere around 90, 91, somewhere like that. Joseph was born 14 years after, jo uh, after Yaakov, J Jacob, left for Padan Aram. He worked seven years, got Leah, and then he also had Rachel, but Rachel was barren for almost seven years. So in Jacob's 14th year in Padan Aram, that's when Joseph was finally born. Okay, so, um, and, and Joseph's going to be sold into Egypt when he's 17 or 18 years of age. So if he was born in the 14th year, Jacob stays there till his 20th year, that, that um, makes Joseph about six years old when Jacob moved back to the land of Israel. And then if it took him about 10 years, 10, 11, 12, maybe even up to 15 years to get down to Beersheba, then you can see how J Joseph is aged. Joseph is, is now about... Well, when he goes into Egypt, he's going to be 17, 18 years old. So um, Isaac was still alive. Isaac was alive when Yosef is sold off in, into slavery. Okay, we don't read that. We, we can put it together by the ages and know, but we don't read about it. We don't read what the grandfather's reaction was. We read what the father's reaction was. It almost killed him. And I can imagine the grandfather grieved also. But uh, Isaac is 167, and Jacob is 107 when um, Joseph is sold off into slavery. You know, so we just kind of got to open our minds a little, expand our, our mind a little bigger. Um, so uh, Jacob goes down into Egypt when he's 130. We won't get to that till chapter 47. But if, if um, okay, if Jacob is 130 when he goes to Egypt, and he is 120 when Isaac dies, then Isaac dies about 10 years before they're going to go down into Egypt. Just so you see, there's time in here. Um, you know, again, it, it, everybody felt like, well, Rachel had the baby, and died in, in birth, you know, in the same year that, that they came and the curse had been made by Jacob, and yet it was 10 years in between there. So I'm just trying to help you see there's a time spread here. So that also means when Yosef reveals himself to his brothers, he, we've gone through his time in prison, we've gone through his raising to the throne, the five years of plenty, and now we're into the second year of famine. He's 39 or 40 years old by the time he's meeting his brothers again. They threw him into slavery when he was around 17, 18. So you can see how a 17-year-old Jewish boy is now a 40-year-old dressed like an Egyptian sitting on the throne, why the brothers wouldn't have recognized him. You know, that's, that's a big change. It wasn't just an overnight thing. Um... What else can I tell you? The, you'll read this. You'll read that Joseph was 30 when he came before Pharaoh in chapter 41 and verse 46 and chapter 37 and verse 2. So I think that's probably all I just need to give you to let your mind expand and to, to let space come in here. And we'll come back into the time we're at now, which is when Isaac dies, because he's 180 in verse 28, but 29 makes it very clear. Then Yitzhak breathed his last and died. You may have the old King James. It says that he gave up the ghost. The Hebrew basically says he breathed out, and the idea from the Hebrew that, that is carried by the mindset of those with that background, he breathed out and sank down. Now, I can uh, uh, 
understand that when uh, at this time, which is prior to Yeshua being on this earth, dying for our sins to, kept, to wash away our sins forever, the sins are only being covered at this point. They're not <laughs> washed away till the, the blood that has been put on the mercy seat for us that was perfect. So when they, when people died during this time, I think you're all familiar, they went into the heart of the earth. They went into Sha'ol, S-H-E apostrophe O-L. Sha'ol was the, the abode of the, the dead, quote, I'll put it that way. It had two compartments. It had a suffering side and it had a paradise side. Abraham's bosom was a nickname given to the paradise side, but it was also called paradise. That's why when Yeshua, Jesus, said to the thief on the cross, when he said, remember me, the, the Yeshua said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He was speaking of the Sha'ol, um, the, the side, what did I just call it, the uh, paradise side, Abraham's bosom. When you are told that Yeshua, Jesus, went into hell and suffered for three days for your sins, no, he did not. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished, tetelestai, it is done, it is paid in full, it is over. He gave up his life, the life blood was, was there. That's what's placed on the altar, not any works that he did. The, to, go, to say he had to go into hell and suffer for three days would add works to his blood. Nothing's added to the blood, it's nothing but the blood. So here at the same way, the Hebrew expression of someone giving up their ghost, someone giving up the spirit, they're going down into Sheol. Now, depending on what they did, putting faith in the coming um, salvation of Yeshua would put them into the paradise site. If they did not believe in the God of Israel and his coming um, son, Messiah, Savior for us, then they would go into a suffering site. Luke 16 makes it very clear. It is not a parable. It's in the midst of a book that gives you a number of parables, but Yeshua Jesus gave a name. Anytime he named somebody, it was not a story. It was a reality. He talked about Lazarus being um, a beggar, sitting at the gate to the temple, begging his whole life. And when he died, he went into Abraham's bosom. He's being comforted there. The rich man that ignored the beggar, never did a thing for him, didn't have a heart for the poor, which means he also didn't have a heart for God, wasn't in obedience to God, died in his own sins, and he went into a suffering side. He sees Lazarus the beggar, and he sees a gulf in between, he sees that, that he's in comfort, he's in torment, he says to Abraham who's kind of like the head over over the abode where they're they're residing at this moment he said send Lazarus over let him dip his finger on the water and touch my tongue you know just give me just a, that tiny bit of comfort and Abraham says you can't there's a great gulf in between no one can cross over from one side to the other when we die our fate is sealed we are either dying in the Lord or we're dying apart from the Lord no one is sent to hell with no choice. Everyone has that choice. What they do with that choice depends on their future. So the rich man had chosen to reject God's way of salvation. He's suffering. The beggar, even though his life was miserable, had his faith in the God and what God had promised, and he's in paradise. So when Yitzhak, at this point, is dying, we're told that he was gathered to his people. That also makes it very clear, and that's your next phrase here in, um, in chapter, in verse 29, he was gathered to his people, means that Isaac is now reunited with Abraham and Sarah, his mom and his dad and others who, who had passed away before him. The same way we who are believers today, knowing that paradise has been removed from the earth and is in heaven, so that Paul says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We talk about that. We look forward to seeing our loved ones in heaven, around the throne, where the real tabernacle is and the real mercy seat is, and seeing the shed blood of Yeshua on that mercy seat for us, we're going to be gathered together with our people, with those who've gone before us who are believers, whether they're family, friends, acquaintance, those who we have known through media or whatever. But 
notice how they're uh, they're alive. It's not saying that he went to the 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 um, cemetery and he's amidst the dead bones. He was gathered to his people. Very much an indicator from our Hebrew life after death, and we know that to be a true fact. So Yitzhak leaves his earthly body, goes into Abraham's bosom, is reunited with his loved ones and others who had gone on before him. And it says here that he was an old man. Well, I'll agree with that. He was 180. <laughs> <laughs> and in mine it says of ripe age. The Hebrew again is, you may have full of days or something like that, but the Hebrew again is indicating he was satisfied. He lived a good life. He was not feeling like, oh, why am I dying early? You know, why am I being robbed of getting to have life experiences? No, he was satisfied. He had lived a full life. He had seen his grandchildren. He had seen the blessings of the Lord on, on his son, who is going to carry on for him in the spiritual leadership of his home. He died content. He died satisfied. He died happy. And he went into a place of comfort. So... Why is Yitzhak's death placed here? If I've just told you, he's still alive when Yosef gets sold into slavery. Why don't we have that part of the story? Why do we not hear about it in relation to that? Because that's a major event. And I can imagine as a grandparent how you would feel if your grandchild was kidnapped. You know, basically, or actually for him, he thought his, his the son, the grandson was dead because Jacob's given, quote, evidence to believe that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. So why don't we read about it there? Why don't we read about Isaac in order when he died? And the reason why is because God is not concerned here with giving you the order of the family and, and how that went, but he, every purpose for the lifespan of Yitzhak that we need has, has now concluded. Now that Yaakov has come into the, his father's heir, he's come into that position of firstborn, he's now taking over and being the spiritual leader, we're going to go on and follow his life. So there's no purpose to need to know every detail that happened in Isaac's life. We don't know what all happened except for the few stories that we are told. So that's the purpose here is God is showing us that it's gone from Avraham to Yitzhak. We saw that. Now it's gone from Yitzhak to Yaakov to Jacob. And we're going to go on with the importance of Jacob's line. The most we're going to get is one little sidetrack in chapter 36, and I'll give you reasons for it. That's Esau's line. But then we're going to go right on with Jacob's sons, grandsons. We're going to go very quickly in chapter 37. We're into Yosef's life. And we're going to spend more chapters on Yosef than we did on Avraham or Yitzhak. And I think even more than on Jacob. In fact, I'm sure of it. Yes, Dora. Okay. Uh, how did you say you spell uh, Shaol? S as in Sam. H is in heaven. <laughs> e is in Edward. And then there's apostrophe O L. Oh, it's O L. I thought it was S H O and then E L was in the end. <clears throat> oh, and you were thinking it's the word God. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask, okay, so E L, doesn't it mean God somewhere along the line? So. Good for you. Good for you. But so it's you, but it's not okay. right. Right. It's O L on the end. But if it had been, you were right on. You've got your Hebrew down. I'm proud of you. <laughs> but um, and I don't remember what Shaol means. Um, literally, I'll look that up. I know literally that our Hebrew says he breathed out. Some say he sank down, and we know that he went to Shaol. Um, <coughs> But I can't remember from the Hebrew. It might mean abode of the dead, but don't quote me. I'll look that up. Okay. This one you know, says, he gave up the ghost. Yes, there you go. That's another way of saying it. You know, so um, I don't want to write on the back of that. Let me write on this the name shelf. If I don't write it down, I won't remember and follow through. I'll give you the literal meaning next week. Okay, but we all understand, right? Everybody's clear with Sha'ol being the, the holding place for both the godly and the ungodly at this point in our history. Okay? All right. So, sadly, Yitzhak has left this earth. He's gathered to his people. We're not sorry for him. 
that he was an old man of ripe age and sons Esau and Yaakov, Jacob, buried him. So united in their common grief. This is their father, even though they had a, a rough, and I can't call it childhood because Jacob, you know, he was, he was 70 plus when he went off to Padan Aram. Uh, Esau was already married to two wives, you know, they weren't kids, but they had that big, <laughs> parting of the ways that we see and remember they met when the, Jacob came back Esau did not try to kill him Esau was wanting to bless him and Jacob was wanting to bless Esau so in the 20 25 years that uh, Jacob has now been back in the land and now all the way down to Beersheba and living in where Isaac and Abraham live in that time Jacob and Esau probably had a number of times when they met number of times when they got together. Maybe it was for a, a, a holiday, a holy day, you know, whatever. There had to have been reason. And we even get that, that idea from chapter 36, which we'll be into shortly, where it seems like it's an amicable separation. When Esau's going to take his family this way and Jacob stays in the land. We're going to touch on that very quickly, so I, I won't say more about that. But um, it's highly unlikely that this would have been the first time they came together. Highly unlikely. It seems like they had somewhat of a relationship. Together, they buried their father. Where did they bury him? Anyone remember? Yeah, ground. <laughs> Actually, above ground. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just yeah. closed. There we go. <clears throat> okay. If, if, as soon as I say it, you'll say, oh, I remember you talking about that. <laughs> In the cave of Machpelah. That's where Abraham and Sarah are buried, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. Well, that means that that's how Isaac got there. You know, we've said it. We've said these are the ones who are buried there. Rachel's the only one missing because she's buried outside of Bethlehem where we just had her lose her life in childbirth. But go with me just so that you know I'm not making up stories. <laughs> Genesis 49. Bereshit, chapter 49, and verses, what do I want, um, 29 and following. Let's start at 29, I think we can do that safely. Okay, um, that starts with, then he charged and said to them, um, I've got to get you that word, that we've got Isaac talking. Uh, well, we've got... Yeah, there it is. Okay, just jump in and trust me. You can read it on your own. 28 to the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, everyone, with blessing appropriate to him. Then he charged them and said, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that's in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that's the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite, remember that word too, Hittite, for a burial site. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I, Jacob speaking, buried Leah, the field in the cave that is in it purchased from the sons of Heth. Okay, so Jacob's charging his sons, hey, I'm about to die, make sure you get me in the cave where all these others are. I buried your, my dad there. I buried your grandfather there. I buried your grandmother there. I want to be buried there. My wife Leah is buried there. So this is where we get it. Um, that, um, well, in chapter 50 in verse 13, that might have been the simpler one to take you to. Just go right next door. Go to chapter 50 in verse 13. And there we read. Make sure you wonder how big the cave was. <laughs> it is large. I've been in it. Oh. It's large. In fact, call up Cave of Mappah and you can put up a picture I showed way back. I probably showed when Abraham bought it to the group. But if you can call mm -hmm. it up and do it, we can show it again. Um, okay, so chapter 50 and verse 13. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with the field for a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. Mm -hmm. So he just summarizes it a little bit. But... Um, and after he had buried his father, Joseph, Joseph returned to Egypt. So Jacob's buried there. He's right now burying his father Isaac there. Um, it's got a building built over it. It is um, oh, wow. 
argument, there are, there you go, see, and they're calling it the Ibrahimi, I can't even say that, mosque, because the Muslims, you know, look to Abraham as their father also. They follow Ishmael rather than Isaac. They say Ishmael's the son that was almost sacrificed, and they, they, they make a big deal over Ishmael. They're not following the scriptures. They're following the Quran. All those pictures that you're showing, if they're seeing any of them, all of it. That's the huge, it's like a mosque. They do do services there, but you walk in there, and you see... Um, you know, they're buried in the ground literally, okay, but above the ground is a monument that's been placed over it and they've got like carpets or a fabric over the actual monument over, like we, we used to put up a headstone in a graveyard. Okay, only they've done a monument and then the Muslims came along and built the building over that. But you'll see, you can, you look through like a gate and you'll see here's two tombs side by side and they tell you that's Abraham and Sarah. <coughs> you go down just a little space in that building and you oh, see two more that are um, Isaac and Rebecca. And then you go a, a little bit more and you can see where Jacob and Leah are. Oh. So it, it is, it's very good sized. You know, it was a whole field and this was just a, a part of the field. Roger's trying to get it up. Um, I may just move forward because it's 240. I'm yeah. going to give our house a little bit of heat because someone's <laughs> motioning it. They're cold. And it is cold out there today. <laughs> so I don't want her to think she just got moved to the cave of Mopala. <laughs> and I don't want her to wish she were buried either. <laughs> so we'll just add in a little bit of heat and I'll talk loud over the heater. Okay? That's What's cool. interesting while he's calling up, yeah, that's the whole place. Okay? Inside that whole thing, that main building there that you see, and there is room for all six of those to be buried mm -hmm. and for them to have little areas where they can do their service or whatever you know it's it's uh, now you're beginning to get pictures inside you know that's one of the gates that that you look through it and you see where the grave is they did the same thing with David's tomb on Mount Zion Mount Zion you can see that a lot of people have gone to that that have not gone here because that's an easier access for tourists so um, if you've seen Jacob's tomb it's a lot the same idea <coughs> Uh, not Jacob, I'm sorry, <laughs> David. If you've seen David's tomb, you've got the same idea. Anyway, Google it if you want more. What's interesting is Isaac thought he was dying before. Remember, go with me on our way back to where we want to be. Go back to Genesis 27. Okay, and in Genesis 27, verse 2, Isaac Yitzhak said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. So take this, and, and he goes on, he, he wants him to, that's when he's going to give the birthright to Esau. He thinks he's dying. You know, hey, go get me game. Let me bless you, give you the birthright, and our story goes, you know, from there. That was 43 to 45 years ago. <laughs> he, he lived a whole lot longer than he thought he was going to live. Now, in all fairness to him, if he dies at 180, he was 135 plus when he thought he was going to die. He wasn't 20 saying it. He was, you know, older, but he still outlived uh, Rebecca. He outlived his wife, and he lived that many more years. So our time is in God's hands, and we should not be presumptuous about when they are going to be. Short or long, it is according to God's plan and his purpose. So as we move into chapter 36, I told you we'd get there today, and i got to keep my word. <laughs> um, as you move into chapter 36, by the time of Yitzhak's death at 180, that means Esau has been married for about 80 years. Okay? Because in Genesis 26, 34, I should have told you to stay there. We were close. I'll go back, and you can just listen if you want. Genesis 26, 34... trying to get it there. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basimah, the daughter of Elan, the Hittite. Okay, so there's his two wives, his two heathen wives. Remember when Rebecca goes to Isaac and said, I can't handle it if Jacob marries heathen wives. She's got, he's got to marry somebody from the family, somebody of the faith. <coughs> 
I can't, you know, if these heathen wives are going to be taking care of me because I outlive you, you know, this, this is not good. They did not have a good relationship. I'm sure that these girls were bringing in idolatry and heathen ways that was grieving Rebecca's heart. Uh, and she was approaching her husband with a, hey, we've got a problem here. So uh, anyway, but my point here is he had married, and I'll just say it as best I can in English, and I don't even know that I get it all right in that. Judith and Basimoth were Esau's wives when he was 40, okay? If Jacob is 80, when um, his dad dies, Esau is his twin. Esau's 80 also. So um, actually, actually, I'm sorry, that was when they married, when he married. Isaac dies at 180. Jacob's 120. Esau is 120. He married at 40. He's been married for 80 years. How would you like to be celebrating your 80th anniversary? I've got a dear, dear friend in the desert who um, was just short of his 72nd year of marriage. His wife just went home to heaven about 10 days ago, so keep Jim in prayer, just for the comfort of his heart. You don't, you don't stop a habit of 72 years easily. But that's extremely rare. And here we are now um, seeing this as a more normality in those days because they did live longer in those days. So now again, back to chapter 36. Um, <clears throat> I'm just giving you your background. Um, Jacob has been married about 40 years. So Esau has a whole generation on Jacob. If he's been married for 80 years, he's been married a lot longer than Jacob. Um, and so he's got, you know, he started in kids sooner, grandkids, great grandkids, you know, it would just go on. If Jacob fled at about 77 years of age, then he marries seven years later, you can see he got started in his 80s with having children, where Esau got started in his 40s having children, okay? So Esau's kids are a lot older. The, the cousins have a 40 year spread. Um, I don't want to say a whole lot more and confuse you, <laughs> so I think I'll leave it at that. If you're questioning years or age or something, ask me and I'll try to make it clear to you again. But I think we're ready to go into verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is Edom. Or you may have, who is Edom? Okay. Edom is the name given to Esau's descendants. It's their national designation. They're going to live in the land of Edom, and so they become known as Edom. Esau becomes like the head of the family, known by the name. He could be called Edom rather than Esau, even though the two are the same. The family is going to be called the Edomites. Okay? I think you're familiar to all that we just read. Hittites, we've got Hittites and Horites, Amalekites. We've got a number of ites here, you know, in this story right now. We have later the, the Israelites. Remember, Jacob's now called Israel, and his kids were called Israelites. Today, they're commonly called Israelis. Okay, so Edom is giving that national designation. Edom was a country also called Seir, S, again, S, S is in Sam, E-I-R. Look with me at chapter 32, just back a few pages, chapter 32 and verse 3, 32-3 says, Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Okay, so... Seir is in Edom. Edom is where Esau's family is going to be known for, from coming from that area. Back in chapter 36, where we're at, whoops, I did the wrong way. It's going to take me a second to get there. Back in chapter 36, where we are right now, verse 8, drop down to 8. We're going to come back up to verse 1 in just a moment. But it says there, so Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. So it becomes synonymous. It, it's, I think, understandable. Um, Seir was named after the Horite Seir. So there is, was a man of the Horite peoples named Seir. The hill country took on his name. So he had to have been predominant in that area. I am told that when you hear a 
family name of a city in America, it often was because that family is settled that city, that community, that town. The closest I can get you to understanding is to go back into my heritage on my mother's side. I'm at least fourth generation, if not fifth generation Californian. And even though we don't have the records, we are told that our family came across in the covered wagons to California. There is a place back east, a city called Chaffinville. The family name was Chaffin, and it's believed that they were there, had settled that area before some of the Chaffins moved on, and so the community became known as Chaffinville. It was the, the village of Chaffin, of the family of Chaffin. So I think you understand that's what happened here. Seer was predominant, and the area became known as Seer because of this Horite. He lived in this land that's taking on the name Edom before Esau did. Because remember, Esau has been living in Beersheba. He's been living with his, his dad Isaac and his mom Rebecca, the same as Jacob did. Esau got to stay. Jacob had to go to Padan Aram, part of God's plan. But remember, they sent Jacob off because Esau wanted to kill his brother. So Esau stayed in that area. When he's living in that area, Seir is settling in the area that became known as the Mountains of Seir, or Mount Seir, or, or just Seir. It was a hill country. And the area that that's in, Esau's family is now, we're going to see in chapter 36, moving into that area, predominant in that area, pretty much takes over that area. So now Seir is in the land called Edom. Okay, maybe at this point, go ahead and bring me up map number one, please, Roger, to show them it might help. Uh, as he's doing that, let me tell you that it was an area of about 100 square miles. It was south of what would become Judah's kingdom. It extended from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba on the Red Sea. And that's where I think I better wait as I'm giving this description until mm -hmm. he can get a map up there. We went and got the cave of Mont Pla on his way. <laughs> there you go. Okay, only, yeah, there we go. That's, yeah, that's the one I want. If you go to the purple, it's on the right side. Whoops. Okay, go to the purple. Okay, the purple I'm pointing out. Well, actually, I mentioned the pink, the kingdom of Judah. Don't get it too big. You got it too big. Shrink it again. Oh. Shrink it back for me, please. All right, there you go. Can you do it? Give me a second. It's, it's just moving real slow. <laughs> okay, sorry. But yeah, you, I wanted it a little bit larger than at first, but then you went way too big. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. hold it right there for a second. That shows it fine. Don't move. Don't <laughs> breathe. <laughs> okay? All right. To give you all bearing what you're familiar with, notice the star in the pink is Jerusalem. That should give you a landmark for today. The body of water that you see in the middle between the pink and the purple, that's the Dead Sea, okay? The, the water in between the pink and the purple. The pink says Kingdom of Judah. When the, um, Israel is divided up later, that's Judah, the son of Jacob, gets that area. But notice on, okay, when you're looking at the maps, I'm going to say on the right side of the Dead Sea is the Kingdom of Moab. Moab. Okay, you, you often hear about Moab and Edom together, okay? Moab is always north of Edom, so right now when we're talking about the, the area of Edom, we're going south of the Dead Sea. You see it real big in that yellowish color down at the bottom here. There's your kingdom of Edom, south of the Dead Sea. It is. It goes from the Dead Sea all the way down, if the map doesn't show it, but if you saw, Egypt's below, the Red Sea is right there, the, the Edom went from the tip of the Dead Sea to the tip of the Red Sea, okay, in, 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 um, <laughs> not, in vertical, in vertical, okay. Now, looking horizontal, it's bounded on the north by Moab, you can see that, and, um, Petra is in the area of Moab, okay? Actually, no, in this map, Petra's going to be in the area of Edom because it's south of the Dead Sea. But we're, we're near the area of Petra when we're in that corner. 
Uh, UC Bozra will mention that later. I won't confuse you right now. But um, Hebron is in the kingdom of Judah, the pink. It's just above the big print that says kingdom of Judah. It's south of the star that says Jerusalem. Do you see Hebron? Can you move the hand over to it, Roger? In the pink, just above the big, yeah, right, come down. That's Jerusalem, come down, 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 right there. Hebron. Hebron, okay. That's the area, and then below where it says Kingdom of Judah is Beersheba, okay. They make those look really distant. Hebron and Beersheba are very, very close to each other, and today the communities are extremely close t together, okay. It'd be more like San Bernardino and Colton than that map looks like. Mm -hmm. Uh, because back then there was a little more space. But that's the area where Isaac lived. That's the Beersheba's where the wells were, the era, uh, Abraham had, the uh, Oak of Mamre that he planted there, all of that. That's the Beersheba area. So Esau's going to move south into the area that is now on this map known as the Kingdom of Edom. So I hope I made that all clear. It feels like that was an uphill battle, but I hope it makes it clear for you. They're south of the Dead Sea. This territory today, I think it's map number three. Go ahead and pop up map number three for me, and we'll just, we're going to come back to that again because I wasn't going to do it yet. But um, is that the third map? Yeah. Okay, well, I can do with it. If you look at the now instead of the then, there you go. Okay. Today where you see Jordan in the pink, you see that little bit of blue, the Dead Sea on the border of Jordan mm -hmm. and Israel. Yeah, right there. That's the area. Then Edom started just below the Dead Sea. It covered part of what's mm -hmm. green today and part of what's pink today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're seeing over there Edom, okay? So the area was what we consider Israel today and what is also considered Jordan, and it's in Jordan that Petra is, okay? So it just gives you, you know, something to hold on to in your mind, hopefully. Now, um, Edom is going to be peopled <laughs> by Esau's descendants. So um, this is the area that God gave to Esau. All right, let's look at that. Joshua 24. Because remember, Joshua is the one that, that uh, led them into the promised land, and it was under his watch that the 12 tribes had the land um, divided and given to them, each tribe the portion that they had. Remember last week, I think it was, we talked about one of the borders of Benjamin was Rachel's tomb, was Bethlehem, was that area. In Joshua 24 and verse 4, and that's Yahushua in our Hebrew, Verse 4, to Yitzhak, to Isaac, I gave Yaakov and Esau. God gave the twin sons to Isaac. And to Esau, I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. So this is talking about a period of time in history, but you see how Esau was given the land that we call Edom by God. That was where he was to live. Jacob was given the land in Israel because it, the, it was to Abraham, then it was to Isaac, and then it was to Jacob, okay? Now, before Esau got there, you've got the Horites. Remember Seir, S-E-I-R? Seir was a Horite. Remember how the area got named, the, the hill country was, was named Seir because of this this like head of the the people but their overall name and I know this gets complicated believe me I'm really trying to simplify it overall they were called Horites you might hear them called the Hurrians of secular history all the way back in chapter 14 they were one of the kings that were de was defeated by Chedorlaomer Chedorlaomer when Abraham comes before Melchizedek uh, Melchizedek um, at that time in chapter 14, they called them um, chieftains, they called them sheiks. Um, I think even, even Genesis 36 where we are, let's go back there. Um, and I think even there we have them called by that name, by chieftain or sheik. Um, look at verses 29 and 30. We're jumping down again and we'll come right back up. Yeah, they're called chiefs down here. So it just means the head. Okay, now they were destroyed 
by Esau's descendants probably about 500, 600 years later. We'll read that in Deuteronomy. And it is important that we see that they are destroyed. And I'll bring out why and prophecies and all that as we go along. But Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, then we turned and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. Remember, Edom went down to the Red Sea. As the Lord spoke to me and circled Mount Seir, remember, that's the hill country in Edom, for many days. The Lord spoke to me saying, you've circled this mount long enough, now turn north. It goes on and it, it tells them what to do. I don't think we need to read it all. You can read it on your own. I'm just proving to you the area that we are in. In that same chapter, verses 21 and 22 says, A people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them. They dispossessed them and settled in their place. Just as he did for the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them. They dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. So the Horites lived in Edom before Esau did, and God allowed the Horites to be destroyed, and Esau and his descendants to take over. That's what we've just read. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because the Edomites are going to be hostile to the Israelites throughout our original covenant, our Old Testament times. Okay? We're going to see the Edomites as the enemy of Israel time and time and time again. Let me give you something that because of our, um, our what we're, the history we're living in right today is very interesting. Go with me to Psalm, to Tehillim, Psalm 137. And I'll help you understand a couple of verses, and you'll see why it is so relevant to what we are dealing with this very day. This is talking about when the children of Israel were taken into captivity by Babylon. So chapter 137 of Tehillim, of Psalm, verse 1 says, By the rivers of Babylon... There we, children of Israel, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. So while they were in Babylon, they're remembering being back in Jerusalem, in Mount Zion, in the area, all of Israel, really. Okay, we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. They they were musical people. They loved to sing. Israel to this day loves her concerts. Remember when the slaughter happened on October 7th, and this is what I'm going to be relating to. The kids that were down at a concert, an open-air concert, Israel still loves their music. This Israel that had gone into Babylon, into captivity, were musicians and singers, and yet their hearts are broken because they're captive in a foreign land. So when it says that they hung their harps on the willows, well, willow isn't going to be able to support a harp. But basically, they hung up their instruments. They are not singing. They're not joyful. They're mourning. And they're mourning their loss of their homeland. But what happened there? For there our captors demanded of us songs, our tormentors mirth, be joyful, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. They were mocking them. Sing, sing with joy, make a joyful sound. I look at it the same way as those who were forced to play in an orchestra for Hitler. And they did it because if they didn't obey, they were killed. So to save their lives, they played beautiful music for Hitler. But do you think their heart was in it? Of course not. Here, the enemy is doing the same thing. Sing, put on a concert for us, be joyful. We don't want to see your tears. We don't want to see you mourning. We want you to be rejoicing. Well, how can you ask a people being held captive to rejoice? I'm asking what's happening to those captives in the tunnels in Gaza right now today. What are their captors demanding of them? And I fear to hear that answer one day because some of the stories of the few that made it out are not good. Okay, go with me down to verse 3. Oh, we've done 3. Go with me to verse 7. Remember, O Lord, 
against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. If you don't understand those words, as Jerusalem was being destroyed, the enemy was going, hurrah, hurrah, smash it, smash it to smithereens. Don't leave anything, just destroy it all. And they're rejoicing. And what did a people and you know who I'm talking about, do on October 7th, when thousands were torturing and killing. The stories are so horrible, it, it makes me want to cry as I think of them. And the people that were rejoicing, that were dancing, that were passing out candy to the children, that were calling it a holiday, and that were rejoicing. And I thought to myself on October 7th, how can man be so inhumane to man? And God said to me, it's been here all along, Rochelle. This is what took place at Babylon. This is what's taken place in Israel's history all along. And very often, the interesting thing is, it is out of the line of the Edomites that these are the people who are doing this. And that's why what you're hearing today, and in light of the fact that we're coming up to Purim, Purim is the time of the book of Esther. It's the time when the Jewish people were to be annihilated. They were to be killed for one reason. They were Jewish. That was it. What's wrong today with the Jews that have been taken into captive? They're Jewish. Did they do anything wrong? Some of them that they took into captivity literally were peace activists asking their own country, give them back land so we can have peace. And yet they're now living a captive life, tortured life, or they've even been put to death. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Here we see, at the time of Esther, the same thing. Hamon, Haman, is the enemy in the book of Esther. Haman is an Agagite. An Agagite is one who came from the line of the Amalekites. The Amalekites are the ones who come from what we're talking about right here. Out of this land of Edom, out of Esau's descendants, come these lines of the people. And I can take you into to scriptures and show you that God said you'll have trouble with them in every generation. God told them, wipe them off the face of the map. God told them to do that. This is your enemy. Destroy them all. King Saul, one of the examples that most of you remember, King Saul was told, don't bring their animals in. Why kill their animals? Kill every human wipe them off the face of the map. They were such a destructive people that God said it is better for them to be put to death than that they come in and are your slaves because their influence and their lives will continue on. Saul left the king alive. He also brought in some of the animals. He paid for it in both ways. He lost his kingdom over it. God judged him. But that king, was the, his descendant was Haman. Haman's descendants today are some of those that have done what has happened in South Israel. Amazing. And God said, and I think I can get you the scripture real quickly. Um, here, I think I've got it on this paper. Um, yeah, let, let me take you. I just killed the clock. <laughs> that word. <laughs> but I did. I think Freud would say something about that. I never have liked those things. <laughs> Let me show you real quickly Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17 and verse 8. Just to give you the background. So we're going to go past verse 8 quickly. But here's then Amalek. Amalek is the name I'm talking about. And you hear today much is being said about the spirit of Amalek. That's the spirit that is saying wipe them out for no reason except that they're Jewish eliminate them. If you eliminate the Jew, you'll eliminate the problem. Hitler said that also. When Hitler was rising to power, Hitler claimed that. He didn't suddenly do it when he got into power. He claimed you need to get rid of the Jews. The Jews are the problem. And he said this isn't a war for land. It's not a war for regions. This is a war to eliminate the people called the Jews. And that's what he tried to do. That's what Am Amalek tried to do. That's what 
Edom and the descendants that are in the spirit of Amalek are trying to do. They want to wipe out an entire people because they're Jewish, and that's all it is. In verse 8, this is the first time in uh, Exodus 17, the first time, the first enemy against Israel here. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Okay, to make the story short, this is when Moses, when he kept his arms up in praise and worship and, and looking to the Lord, they were victorious. And when his arms got tired and they dropped down, the enemy would start getting stronger and start winning. And they caught on to that. So they had um, Moses sit, and Aaron and Hur held Moses' arms up so that they would stay victorious until they won against um, Amalek. Okay, that's your story here that's going on. So verse 8 tells us that, that they fought them at Rephidim. That's in the promised land. Verse 16 says, And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Okay, God foreshadowed, forewarned this evil spirit that wants to just wipe out the Jew. That, that's right here at this time, even before they're called Jews, that wants to wipe them out. It's the same spirit you're going to see in every generation. So when I see it in my generation with what's called today Hamas, Hezbollah, these that are arch enemies of Israel that do not want a land so that they have a place to call their own, they want from the river to the sea. All of Palestine will be free is their mantra, which means it'll be Jew free. Palestine will become an Arab land. The Arabs have many lands. It's not that they need another land. What they want, not what they need, but what they want is the annihilation of the Jewish people. They want the annihilation of Israel. They want to wipe every Jew off the face of the map. Make no mistake. Were they to get the land of Israel? Were they to be successful from the river to the sea? And that, that's from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the border that, that where Jordan takes over an Arab country. If they were to get that, their next step would be after the one who has supported Israel. That's America. They call Israel the little Satan and they call America the big Satan. They will come and hunt every Jew down in America. They'll wipe America out because America supported the enemy called Israel. That's the spirit of Amalek. It's not that they need a land. It's not that they are occupied. It's not that they have issues that we need to, as human beings to have. This is a people that's bent on nothing but destruction. And we see it all the way back here in Exodus. We see it repeated time and again, as I already said, Esther, and I already showed you Hitler, and I've showed you Hamas now today. And in Deuteronomy 25, and I am taking a few moments sidetrack here, but I think it's very important that you understand the enemy of today. In Deuteronomy 25 and verse 17, God speaking to Israel said, remember what Amalek did to you, meaning remember Rephidim, remember Exodus 17, remember what happened here. And in verse 19, God repeated it to them again and said, you must not forget. Why can they not forget? Because forget will lead to exile. Forget will lead to annihilation. If they don't realize and destroy that enemy, it is there to destroy them. They cannot make peace with it. They cannot sit, sit down at a peace table and negotiate peace because there's nothing these people want except them to be dead. And that's it. That's what they are after. Why is this happening again and again in every generation? Why is there this spirit of Amalek that keeps rising up and wants to destroy them? Is it because the Jew is so bad? Is it because they really are a subhuman race and they really shouldn't have air to breathe and land to live in? And I know none of you would believe that. I hope I'm still moving because my whole screen, I hope you're still hearing me, my screen has frozen. But I'm gonna trust that you're hearing. And I'm not gonna say that I wonder who's playing with our <laughs> media right now. The whole point is, prior to Yeshua, 
if Satan could have succeeded through any of these people, and he is the actual one behind this, this behind Amalek or behind whoever's leading the charge at the time. Right now, Sinwar is Satan's tool. He's the head of Hamas. He's the one that called for this mass murder. And, and what did the people do when they were being murdered? They were rejoicing. They were celebrating the same thing, just like I read in Psalm, and just like I read in Exodus, and just like I took you in where we read about in Babylon. The same thing happening. Prior to Yeshua Jesus coming, if, if, if Satan could have succeeded and wiped out the Jewish people, there would be no Messiah. There would be no Savior. He would not have had a place to come, a people to come to, prophecies to fulfill. It would be all off the page, and the God of this world would be Satan. Now, he's got power, but he's not God's opposite. God created him. And God has him limited, and God will finally destroy him. But that was all prior to the cross. So why now? Why doesn't Satan say, oh, I, I lost. I was defeated. Jesus came. It's all over. Because he has the audacity to believe that he can still destroy God's plan of promise to Israel. He's promised Israel. That Messiah is coming again. Messiah is going to rule and reign a thousand years from Israel. He's got a plan to fill the whole nations of the world with blessing from Israel. But Satan wants his kingdom, which is this earth, he wants it back. He doesn't want worship to go to God. He doesn't want it to go to, to the Messiah. He doesn't want it to, to flourish in the land of Israel. He wants it all to be him. Remember what he wanted? I'm going to sit in the north. I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to receive the, the, the worship. I, 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 I. He had the I, I, this is, okay? And he still got it. And his spirit, he works in the hearts of man that he can find. And I believe every generation, he has one that he thinks could be his, who we call Antichrist. Because he doesn't know what, when God's going to do what God's doing. He just knows, i got to come against it. i got to come against it. And if you don't think that the spirit in the Antichrist is the spirit of Amalek, is the spirit of Satan, and the intent in the tribulation time is to wipe out Israel, to wipe out the Jews, then go open your Bible and read again. Read Daniel, read Revelation, and there is no way you can escape that this is an attack on the Jewish race, on Israel, because God has made a promise and a plan to bless Israel, to bless the land, and to use it as his priestly people to take the blessing to the entire world. And when Messiah rules on this earth, peace is in all of the earth, not just in Israel. It's in all of the earth. All the nations come up and worship the Lord. All the nations go back home with blessing on them because they've come and worshiped the Lord. It is a beautiful, beautiful plan. And the only one against it is Satan and those that are his henchmen, the, the fallen angels that fell with him. So that is why we see it and why it's so important to understand. And the roots of it are starting right here. We're going to see the trouble that comes in right here. So... I have derailed. Um, I will come back on track, but I think it's very important for us to understand that th that's what comes out of Esau's um, descendants, the Edomites. They were hostile to Israel in Esau's day. They're hostile to Israel all the way through. If you look into the enemy of Israel, you'll be able to trace the roots back, and you will see where they come from. So interesting how history is repeating itself how true is history is to what god said would happen can you tell me if they're still hearing me i've taken by faith that they are because we've been frozen the whole time you've been gone no. or about the whole time oh. you're not allowed to walk out of the room again roger <laughs> my screen's gone the screen is frozen but have they heard me no i'm not here <laughs> How, are they hearing me? Can you tell? I, well, they should be able to, but I, I can't tell. Okay, I'll tell you what, for sake of purposes, because this is so important, 
I'm going to ask somebody who's good with their cell phone to text me. Don't call me. My phone's on silent. But send me a text if you're hearing my plea <laughs> and say, yes, we're hearing you. <laughs> and I'll watch for that to come oh. in. No. One minute ago, Lita sent no sound frozen to. God's grace and supernatural intervention, please. Amen. Amen. So the whole history lesson. Well, Dora, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for being alive. <laughs> thank you and for me. Oh, and yes, you encouraged me. Because when I saw this and I'm thinking, uh-oh, at least I knew, okay, well, I'm still communicating. But I'm going to wait and see if we can get it back on. We may need to go out of Zoom and come back well, in. I might have to shut the computer down because that's what's the problem. Okay. Um, and what that will do to the recording. Was this still recording? This is still recording. The whole so day. what I said can go up on the um, Bitly site. Yeah, I just, you know, I all this stuff out, yeah. Okay. At least that's safe, because I don't know if I could do that again. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. Uh, I've got just a little more history to give, and, and we're not getting far today, but I think it's important. Am I right or am I beating it to death? Oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah, keep going. Sister. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I've listened to a couple of pastors recently. I even listened to one last night for an hour on this also. And I wasn't like, okay, you've made your point. Go on. I was like, yeah, you know, and, and give me more scriptures. Feed yeah. my, you know. So to me, it's important. But I, I just want to know I've got the heartbeat of the people, too, that it's not just me. Yeah. So. My apologies, apparently it's uh, Roger's computer that had issue. He thinks maybe Zoom also had an issue that both, you know, glitched at the same time. I don't know. I can't know. get back on with my computer. Yeah, Roger can still not get up on his computer. That's why I guess Eddie called us and got us in on uh, this call. And uh, I, I kept teaching. I saw the screen frozen. But I kept teaching until I could get Roger to work on it, hoping you all were at least hearing and I had my live audience. But uh, they're willing, the, you know, I went through the history the, of the Edomites um, in relation to today, the Amalekites and Hamas and, you know, how that all ties in. Um, I think what I'm going to have to do is start at the beginning of that next week. You might have heard some. I'm not sure where we actually lost you, to be honest. Um, but my point is we will put up to the, our Bitly site for any who go to the website, to the YouTube site. We will put up what's there. I'll, I'll put an ending on it when I can. So if you don't want to wait a week to get the history wherever we left off, you can get it from there, but I will repeat it next week. It's where I'll start again. Uh, I, I do believe in, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you did hear the start of the history of the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. Is, is that correct? Did you get the yeah, beginning? Okay. That, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Then that's where I'll pick it back up and we'll move forward from there. But unfortunately, it's 334. And, you know, it, we have to just give it up, and I have to just stand by faith that the Lord's allowed this to happen for a reason, hanging in there and being so loving and patient for me in the midst. But Lord, we thank you that you are the ultimate authority. You are in charge, and you've even allowed this glitch for a reason. We're going to trust that you're working it for your glory in some way that we can't see or understand right now. But I pray that as each go out, the blessing of realizing how in control you are of history past, history present, and history future will encourage each one, no matter the struggles that they're facing in their life right now. Be with each and strengthen them and give them wisdom for the next step and the next step because you alone know what our future holds. You alone know the tests and the trials. You know the victories. You know the day that you're taking us home. And Lord, we want to be found faithful until that very moment. So please bless and go with and encourage and strengthen and help and heal and bring breakthroughs, whatever is necessary. May we come back in another week rejoicing over what you have done, over what we've been allowed to do to bring glory to your holy name. And may we be able to come together for a, a good lesson, Lord, at your feet once again. But we thank you that you are powerful. We thank you that we never get frozen and knocked off with you, that we don't have to go through technology that you are more than Wi-Fi, <laughs> that uh, it's, 
your throne room is always open and you're always with us. And for this, we praise you and thank you forever and ever. In the name of our precious Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen.